I'm just curious about your, your opinions and your stance on that. Let's see, that's a good question. Um, in terms of guns, um, you know, it's interesting that uh, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, um, is so, has so much money and so much influence on these politicians that we can have all of this gun violence going on um, in, in this nation and yet it doesn't seem like um, the politicians want to do anything about it. Um, and, and, and I think about, how many of you all saw the um, Super Bowl halftime show? Beyonce is coming under a little, little bit of uh, scrutiny <laughs> because she uh, made a, a political statement through, and I didn't even realize when I was so busy with, you know. <laughs> but um, she, um, you know, her dancers had on uh, Ralph Fitz that were reminiscent of the Black Panthers, and um, and so she was expressing some sense of pride in her her culture, her, uh, her daughter's hair, her, her husband's uh, nostrils or whatever. <laughs> and she was making, you know, showing some pride in, in terms of that. And the police got very upset about that. And it just reminded me, because uh, she had also, what they call, <laughs> dropped a video the day before, uh, a new uh, music video called Formation. and. Um, it had her at the end of it on a police car uh, in Louisiana, New Orleans, around the time of Katrina. And going. So she was making a lot of statements with that. But it's just interesting to me that the police can get, and so they, they boycotted, I understand, uh, a concert or something that uh, Beyonce did uh, a couple days ago, uh, wherever she was in Miami, I believe it was, and the police boycotted, uh, or at least they said they were going to boycott the concert. So um, I say all that to say that um, you know this nation has a kind of double consciousness because the Black Panthers um, they weren't just about guns, but they were about self-defense, and so uh, and so their 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 right to carry guns was just as legitimate <coughs> as these people who are carrying the white people who can insist on their gun rights today. But a lot of times, it seems as though our perspective on certain issues is based on who is the one who is at the center of the conversation. And uh, so I, I assure you that if black folks started picking up guns, I mean, let's look, let's face it. And, and so when we start talking about this thing about guilt and, and shame and all that kind of stuff, um, Michelle, Alexander um, <laughs> makes the point that, um, you know, that all of us, the, the way the Bible puts it, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the way Michelle Alexander puts it is that all of us have made mistakes. I don't think there's anyone in here who has never broken a law. If, and, and you can only say that if you never, if you drive, if you never drove over the speed limit, <laughs> um, you never ran through a, a yellow light or a red light. Well, hopefully not a red light. Um, but when we look at Black Lives Matter, when we look at all these things that are happening, we can't assume that the people who got shot did anything wrong. There was a 12-year-old boy in Cleveland, Tamir Rice, who was just playing with a toy gun. Okay. Sandra Bland got pulled over for evidently uh, not using her turn signal when she was changing lanes. And so we've got to uh, deliver ourselves from the notion that uh, our people get arrested all the time because we do bad things. We, we, we're just trying to, we are human. We make mistakes. And, but for us to have some, what, uh, be composed of some 90% of those people who are incarcerated in this nation. We're the most, we have the most people in prison of any industrialized nation in the world. And so I'm around the, going around about with your question, 
but basically what I'm saying is that the Supreme Court and Antonin Scalia just, just passed away and he has played a big role in some of this kind of conservative uh, uh, right wing kind of way that they look at things that pertain to black people and other minority people. Um, but the fact of the matter is that um, we are we are judged in a different kind of way. And so whenever the gun issue comes up, the courts want to, and the Supreme Court wants to go, and, and conservatives want to go immediately to the Second Amendment that we all have the right to bear arms. But I think that you have to look at that with a grain of salt because it depends on who is bearing arms. And uh, so we always have to read between the lines because, and that's, that's the genius of racism. It, it creates, and especially this so-called colorblind racism, it's not as in your face as it used to be. I grew up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina uh, in the 50s and 60s. And uh, so I know what segregation is all about, um, and I know what discrimination is all about. But, um, but it was much more in your face and, and, and explicit back in that point. Now it's so subtle. We have these cold words, you know, take our country back. Yeah. And, um, you know, tough on crime. And uh, there's so many other cold words that we use. And so there's a kind of uh, sophisticated racism, in a sense, that takes place today. So the Jim Crow has become James Crow Esquire. <laughs> but it's the same thing. Just that it's obviously piggybacking on that comment, it makes it harder to fight because you know, people can claim that I'm not a racist because, but uh, if you look at the, the numbers, it's, it's, it's not so much individual, you know, someone in your face, it's just the way the whole system is designed. When, when the laws uh, and the policies affect a, a, a large number. And that makes it harder to fight because people can <coughs> hide themselves under a, a veil of, oh, no, this is because uh, of economics. Something else is not race. It's something else that I'm, that I'm, that I'm doing this to you for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, your question was, uh, or suggested, was that folks in the inner city were getting guns to protect themselves. Am I correct? Well, I was asking more, just just like you were saying, like, it, I hear a lot about people talk about, you know, the Second Amendment and your right to gun ownership and, and, and whatnot, and I'm just curious to know how the community feels about, you know, that, that, uh, that right to bear arms, to be protected, just like the Black Panthers, uh, Black Panthers did, and uh, the NRA, that's the whole purpose of it, is that we protect ourselves as citizens from, you know, from whatever government or, or any other um, enemy that we face. I just wanted to piggyback off of what Dr. Rodney had mentioned earlier about um, the, the importance of, you know, when you see children in high school and they come, their parents come and talk to the parent talk to the teacher about you know, their behavior and things like that, and they say, you know, I didn't raise them like that. The key point to that whole scenario that you were talking about, as far as I was concerned. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Do you think that, <laughs> do you think the reason a lot of racism that's coming about, uh, the situation with Beyonce and things like that, do you think that it would be best to make sure that our children are educated about the Black Panthers, to make sure that our children know when they go out the things that they have to do? A lot of times I think that they need to, we need to inform them of what's in the world right now, how it's affecting them. So I just wanted to get someone's statements. It's hard to be so long. <laughs> you certainly have to have your history to know where you're going. So I certainly think we need to inform our children those of us that have raised sons, you, you start early, not just sons, but sons in particular, you tell them early on, this is what's going to happen to you by virtue of who you are and what you look like. So given that, you need to, you know, X, Y, Z, not that they always buy into that, but because 
even when you tell them all those things, <laughs> they're still going to get stopped for something that's trivial or meaningless and still going to get uh, treated differently. But you have to inform them for sure. Don't you? you have to make them aware. Have to make them aware. You have to make them aware. General assumption is that. Use the mic. Thank you. <laughs> Inherent in that question is that the general assumption is that parents know the history. Okay. Kids or young people are being taught history in the schools. Okay. And the schools have their own particular curriculum, which I'm willing to guarantee it that if they do talk about the panther, it's a paragraph. It's not a lesson. It's an animal. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. So I think we're assuming a whole lot about what people should know, and therefore they can transfer that knowledge onto the next generation. But the vast majority of adults have no idea about the history of African Americans. So, you know, it, it's kind of difficult. Anyway, next question. Frank, what do you Young lady right here. Could you all just discuss the connection between uh, mass incarceration, uh, the, military, the militarization of the police force, and the privatization of prisons? Because when I think about that, I think of it's money. Money equals political power. And to me, I have a natural skepticism when I hear politicians, and it's bipartisan now, talking about uh, prison reform. So I guess I would like you guys to discuss that and also talk about, in your opinion, if you could lay out prison reform, what would it look like to you? Wow. <laughs> uh, actually, that I'll last question, <laughs> that last question that we'll deal with later on as a solution. But I do think that Michelle Alexander does talk a lot about um, the financial aspect that when the war on drugs was begun, was waged, that there was money in it for the uh, police departments, and they got funds to militarize um, and to do all these raids, and, and for all, so that there was a financial benefit for them. So yeah, there, there's money is a factor, certainly, and that does... <sighs> I mean, it makes it harder to fight, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's a big, money is a big factor. And um, if, if, we, <clears throat> if we, if we talk about prison reform, um, then we've we got, we got a battle on our hands. Because prison reform, of course, has to do with um, rehabilitation and restoration and helping people to reintegrate successfully back into society and not just stay locked up. But the system that we have now is a prison industrial complex. And so it's big money. Uh, and um, there's this um, private company called um, Corrections Corporation of America, CCA. And so, uh, and think of it, so, so if, Let's, 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 uh, Michelle Alexander talks about um, mm -hmm. compassion, and that's what I like about her work as well. It's not just an intellectual, theoretical thing. She talks about compassion. And, um, but there's so much money tied up in this thing now. Um, the prison, you got to pay for all, not, not only the facilities, the prison facilities, you got to pay pay for all the prison guards and all the staff and all. So it's a, it's a big business, and it's at the expense of primarily of, of black and brown people um, who are, 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 are being victimized. And so if we were really, Michelle also talks about um, that instead of reform, we really need a revolution. And so a revolution is serious business. That you, you're really talking about not window dressing, not just making tinkering, as she says, uh, with the um, with the structures. But you're talking about dismantling the structures 
And, and, and so racism is an institutional concept. It's not just personal prejudice and bias. It's racism means that your personal biases and prejudices are supported and reinforced by the institutions that surround you. Okay, and so um, you talk about a lot of a lot of kickback. You know, sometimes I wonder um, when some of these politicians resist um, things like universal health care and uh, um, you know equal opportunity for all people. Um, it's about, again, it's about money and power. And so it's, and Martin Luther King talked about it, and he said it's not going to be an easy kind of thing. It, when he was doing, he got assassinated right after he started organizing the Poor People's Campaign. And so this nation is not going to just sit back and allow that kind of transformation, that kind of revolution to take place. And they're, you know, they're going to resist that. That's the unfortunate thing about it. That we, if we're serious about, if we're serious about following up what's in this book, the New Jim Crow, then it does call for a massive kind of revolution. Now, let me tell you, say one other thing, just in, along those lines, and that is that she also points to the fact that one of the ways that the, the, the powers that be perpetuate this kind of injustice is that they divide and conquer. So they keep those of us who are the have-nots fighting each other instead of fighting, coming together to fight the powers that be. If we could stop fighting each other, those of us who are marginalized, those of us who are oppressed, and, and, and they even, she even talks about the fact that um, it, this was done when the, when the first Jim Crow came around after slavery. Uh, blacks and poor whites were kept from coming together. And it's the same today. When you see all these people falling around, I'm not going to call any names up in here, but y'all know what I'm talking about. When you see all these uh, poor whites falling after somebody who flies in on a jet. <laughs> they just lifting, you know, these people all up and everything. Then they are actually acting against their own best self-interest. But as long as they can be made to think that they are a little bit higher than black folk, then they'll do, they'll do that. And so it's a real complex situation. You can go into so many directions with each of the questions. And with each of the questions that we get, um, it's no secret about what is happening and how it is happening. When you talk about the military industrial complex and now you talk about the prison industrial complex, the solution is in the origin, how it got started. In a book, another book that I've been reading uh, called um, Condemnation of Blackness, written by Dr. Khalil Gibran Muhammad, who is the grandson of Elijah Muhammad, and who is now the director of the uh, Shumper Schumper uh, Research Center. So it's all in the beginning. Uh, the idea that we see now got started in slavery. Okay. And right after slavery, and then I'm going to shut up, let you guys answer more questions. But right after slavery, a concerted effort was made to document okay, our inferiority through statistical data. Right? So from 1889, from 1890, I believe, we started seeing all of these studies about the inherent criminality of black men and the immorality of black men. Okay? So it's nothing new. And in fact, the book 
one of its primary themes that I think, anyway, is the more things change, the more they remain the same. So it's the same thing that are occurring now under different kinds of hues. Okay? So but anyway, let's, let's move on. Let's my, question, my question is that we have Bill Clinton was the one. Bill Clinton was the person that um, signed these laws, signed these policies into law. And now we have Hillary Clinton running for president. Will this continue if she's elected under her administration? And why isn't it brought to the attention of black people? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What policies? Because they made that bunch of policies. Okay, in the time with Bill Clinton, he signed the, um, the law for mass incarceration back in the 90s. And, I mean, way before that. He certainly. No, but he contributed to it. And, but will those policies continue under Hillary Clinton if she's elected? I mean, only Hillary Clinton. All I can do is. Yeah. I think that the more we have these kinds of discussions, I think the more the Black Lives Matter movement highlights the issues, the more social media, you know, something that we have to our advantage now uh, that shows how much of a crisis this has been. Uh, we stand a better chance of moving people to the left. <laughs> That's a hope. But, you know, uh, I think we have to just keep putting it back in their face that, we know this is a strategy. We know it's intentional. We know it's just not um, a fluke. That these numbers support the fact that this is an intentional strategy. We have to keep keep the message out there. Well, I think that's a, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I also think that um, that we have building on what what Cheryl just said that we need to take that question to Hillary Clinton directly to Hillary Clinton. In other words. Um, the way the media is portraying it now, and, I, and, and you know, I mean, you're right. I mean, black, uh, Bill Clinton was called the first black president. <laughs> but, you know, he did a lot of stuff that, uh, that really wasn't too, too good. Right, what, 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 what too black. And um, <laughs> um, so uh, we don't know what, what Hillary is going to do, but what we, we ought not allow Hillary or any other politician to assume that they have the black vote in their back pocket. In other words, we need to learn as a people, and I think this is one of the messages that comes from, from Michelle Alderman, we need to learn as a people that we have awesome political power ourselves. If we organize ourselves and not let, let anybody, we shouldn't let Hillary, Bernie Sanders, or anybody else take, a, take our vote for granted. And we ought to hold them accountable. We ought to have an agenda. We ought to say, listen, if you want our vote, then we expect you to not do what you just said. In other words, not do what, what Bill Clinton did. When he got, see, he got pressure from the conservatives who had come in and just taken over the Congress and all this kind of stuff. Uh, Newt Gingrich and all of them back in that day and time. And they were flexing their muscles just like you have Ted Cruz and these other people flexing their muscles today. But they what they they are appealing to their base. So if, if if these politicians want to have the black vote, then they need to know that they have to appeal to our and they have to earn it. Not only just appeal, but they have to earn it. So I think that's a that's an excellent question. Good job, Mayor. Sir. Yes, sir, you use your right for the revolution. But the world we should be talking about is re reparation. We should be discussing and tax the media, use all legal ways to demand reparation for our people and of our ancestors. What should be the main topic that we resolve all this issue? If we come from the capitalist system, that we, we need a question from you, sir. Okay, what about reparation? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't. I don't want to ignore that question. I want to. I want to take it seriously. Uh, I don't have. I don't have the answer, but I agree. I mean, I think you're right about reparations. I think um, we talk. Some people talk about reparations, 
But I think the details, the specifics of rep reparations, we need to be very clear about that. How much are we asking for it? What, what, do, you know, how will, how do we want it uh, distributed? You know, how do we want it, you know, and, and just how that that whole piece is going to work. Um, and I don't know if that's laid out clearly um, for us, but I mean, I think for us to put some teeth behind reparations, we have to have a clear plan um, in terms of, you know, what we're asking for and how it's going to be used to uh, improve the quality of life within our community. Yeah. 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 Respond to that. I have a question and a short statement also. <laughs> I wanted to know if you could discuss further the extent to which uh, mass incarceration is economically driven. We, uh, when you deal with uh, reducing mass incarceration, that results in the loss of jobs for many white people across this country. We have prison complexes um, in the state of Maryland, in, Jess in Jessup, Hagerstown, and Cumberland. If we reduce mass incarceration just in our state, you'd be surprised at the number of people in Cumberland where no black folks are other than those incarcerated. In, in, in Hagerstown and in Jessup, how many people would lose their jobs? Now these jobs in these prison complexes have been uh, built in various places because their senators have, have allocated for that, bringing money to that area. We have generations of, of white people who have depended upon us being incarcerated in order for them to live. That's part of the pushback. <laughs> so, so, so my question again was, could you discuss further that aspect of uh, mass incarceration being economically driven? Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me try. I'll try. Um, of course it is. Of course it is. And you're saying that if in fact it's a lesson, lesson of